Wine in Canaan, one of my favorite places, and we're here with Heather Kerner, hey, and she has this amazing Fiber Studio um, home studio called Spiral Works. Welcome, I'm so glad to have you, Serena. I know that you've been here before for open studio tours, but for any who might watch, um, maybe unlike some of the other videos where folks have their own studio spaces, mine is very much integrated into my home life. And um, while well, I attempt to balance parenting and, and fiber work and other work. So I'm going to invite you into the house and I'll show you a little bit more of the candid that not everyone gets to see. <laughs> oh, and uh, what names of the kitty? Oh, yeah. This is Shadow. <laughs> and Luna is wandering. Uh, this is our farmhouse kitchen, which um, on days when I might be felting, I send my family away for an outing, and this is where all the work and the wetness might happen. I'll put the leaves in the farm table and make it as big as I can, and this will become kind of workshop space with a lot of soapy, wet water with kind of sopping towels and things. A lot of people might say, well, why would you do that outside? There is a little bit of a fragile stage when you're wetting down a project where you don't want the wind to take your fiber away and everything. And then once, once my project is wet down, then I might roll it up and carry it right on out the kitchen door this way, out onto the deck. You can follow me. And this is my favorite place to work, uh, yeah. where I might set up a, um, a Rubbermaid table or a rolling table out here where then the rest of the water can kind of drip outside and dry. Um, a nice hot sunny day is a great day to do felting out here because it keeps the fiber and the water really warm, which makes your felt making go a little bit quicker. And so if any of you follow me on Facebook for uh, Spiral Works Fiber Studio, you might see a lot of pictures of my clothesline and literally a project might get finished here on the deck and then come over here to the clothesline in the backyard. My most current work these days is, as you might be able to tell from all of these materials set up in kind of this midway room, is mask production. We're in the middle of COVID-19 precautions. My husband and I both work for school districts, and I've been making dozens and dozens of masks to give to local businesses in Skowhegan. So the felt making has been put away for a little while while I've been producing masks of various sizes and shapes and colors. <laughs> oh, they're beautiful. So that has been the current project. <laughs> That's awesome. But um, having a home studio, I, I have become a master at squirreling away my uh, materials for felt making wherever I can hide them. And this is one of my secret hiding places I'm happy to show you. This would be a miscellaneous drawer of parts and pieces. Right here is a beading drawer with all the fine beading needles and tweezers and other small tools. These are some of my wool drawers right here. <laughs> this is a hank of horsetail hair. A hank. Whoa. You were trying to come up with a word earlier, maybe? Yeah. And um, these are some of my drawers of merino wool fiber that I would use to lay out some of my stuff. Wow. And it's super soft. I tend to work a lot with Australian merino because it's very, very fine and it felts up very quickly. Many of these are hand dyed skeins of what we would call roving, which is wool fiber that's been combed into kind of a long snake shape so that you could pull or draft the wool like that. Mm. I keep them all in plastic to try to keep the moths at bay with my lavender and everything else in here to protect the wool. Um, these drawers are full, and this right here would be a workspace where I might draft and lay out a piece of fabric yardage that I'm working on. And then I'll invite you in the other room to come see some finished product and some other stages. <laughs> This is our living room, but here you'll see some finished work that I've chosen to keep. So some of my work winds up in, in 2D pieces for the wall. And there are some 
here and over in the corner. All of the wool gets stored in Tupperware tubs and everything again to keep it safe from the moths and, and uh, other influences. Uh, but I work a lot with a fiber that would be called like a pre-felt um, material. This is merino wool that has been sent through a chopping machine, much like commercial felt would be made. But it's a very fine grade uh, merino wool um, in various colors. And so these might get fashioned into some of the silk scarves and wraps that I'll show you on the porch in a minute but these are some of the raw materials to use there. And then in recent years, I have taken to dyeing some of my um, silk fabrics that will get felted on to the surface of the wool, and it laminates together in the wet felting process, and it all sticks and becomes one fabric. But by being able to layer colors of wool with colors of silk, you can really, it's a lot like painting. And so this is my uh, silk tub <laughs> where I might store some of the, um, the hand-dyed silk fabrics, which I do in a crock pot, believe it or not. <laughs> and these two are some that I might just tuck into the closet if I'm not using them, but then use to, to design a project. Once the fabric is made, I can show you some... I have other tubs that have already finished felt that is getting ready to be assigned to a project. So this is going to be embedded in a hipster purse. So I would attach my hipster sign to it. But this is a piece of felt that's already been made and what you're seeing here is turquoise wool with pink silk that was laid on top and then another piece of blue silk that was laid on top of that. And when it was wet down and rolled together with soapy water, it all fused and became one piece of fabric that then I like to embroider on top of. So they, here are some different ways that that might look. These are just other experiments. <laughs> this is a seamless ring of felt. There's no sewing here. It's just the looping of wool fiber and felting it so that it makes one long continuous chain. I had a recent foray into resist dyeing. I don't know if this would be interesting for your viewers to see or if you could take a guess at what I was using to resist dye this with. This piece of fabric might have been a yellow piece of felt that I might have thought was a little boring. <laughs> and so, in a process of folding it... Binder clips. Oh, binder clips. I clipped clips. it with binder clips and stuck it in the dye pot. And then, <laughs> wind up with an amazing so visual cool. in that way. So when you see some of the handbags, you're going to see a resist dye technique on those. And other um, finished products, you're going to see the actual tufts of wool. So this shape right here would be the tuft of wool as you draw it or draft it out of a piece of roving. And if you just kind of like curl the edges like it's a mustache and lay it on top of your fluffy wool pile, it will create that shape on the surface, and I really like that shape. It shows up in a lot of my finished work, um, and I like to bead and embroider around it. <laughs> um, so this would be an example of a finished handbag uh, made with genuine leather with the felt panel inset inside. I have a couple of works in progress where I'm really inspired by the carpets of Asia that they might make um, called Sheerdak carpets where you would make a thick piece of felt like this yellow one. Oh, yeah. And you might make a thick red piece of felt and then use a shape. And there are very traditional shapes, but you can use your own too to create um, pieces like this. And then the tradition is to, to 
create reliefs where you might have yellow on red, but then you might have the red on the yellow as well. And these might get um, sewn together to make a big panel that could be like the doorway of a yurt or a carpet. Um, I started felt making in 1999. <laughs> I've been doing this for about 20 years. Um, if I come over this way, I would love to show you how the business started, or my crafting with felt started, which was with um, vessel forms like this. Uh, when I first started felt making, I was making hundreds and hundreds of these vessel forms around balls and balloons, and they created very um, sculptural forms that then I finished with a wire and yarn, kind of like basketry technique on the top. And from there, I started pursuing more formal education in felt making, and I went to several series at the Snow Farm Craft School in Western Massachusetts, learning with felt makers from around the world, and we learned all kinds of techniques. And I entered a phase where I was doing a lot of sculptural felt making. I would make birds and felt balls and um, hats, very sculptural hats for a while. When I first moved to Canaan, I rented a building that was owned by Alan Saul and started a gallery there. And during that time period, I was making a lot of nests and birds and things that were large and for the window. And shortly thereafter, having moved to central Maine, I became acquainted with a leather seamstress because right near here in Canaan, we have had the Heartland Tannery, the leather tannery. And that was really the beginning of kind of a marriage between the felt and leather, which just to me felt like um, a very authentic use for felt. Two really durable materials that could create both an artistic but a, a functional object. So we looked just a second ago at some of the raw materials that might go into a piece of finished felt. And this is a good example of a very thin piece of what they would call Nuno felt, and Nuno is a word that refers to layered felt, or the layering of things together. And this was made with some of that merino pre-felt that we just saw, that's layered like a sandwich on the inside of some of the hand-dyed silk fabric. And by leaving um, spaces or panels between, sometimes you can leave open windows in the felt, or you can create these color blocks by using a different color of the pre-felt on the inside. In this case, it would have been a piece of yellow pre-felt and brown. And this scarf has a number of colors and windows. I don't know if you can see that with your video there, but do you see how just by the absence of the pre-felt in the sandwich, you can leave you know, see-through windows in a scarf, which is not only decorative, but it also contributes to the drapeability of a scarf if you're going to wear it around your neck. That way you're not going to get something that's too stiff. We talked a little bit about resist dyeing, and this is an example of a felt panel that was resist dyed using um, industrial washers and put in a, a black dye pot this one as well. This is an example over here of some of the sculptural options that you might have with felt making where <clears throat> 3D chunks of wool were laid beneath a piece of silk fabric and felted and the silk felted to the wool behind it and that leaves an embossed or a raised texture that can be used for decorative purposes in, in art pieces. I really like to make um, felt works that are accessible to everyone, and I really like to make tiny little bags that can be affordable for anyone to wear a piece, um, and that it doesn't need to be winter in order to enjoy wool. <laughs> Um, several years ago, when my kids were a little bit younger, we had the opportunity to be featured in a German felt making magazine, an international felt making magazine, which 
always amazes me that this page, uh, this picture of us at Lake George in Canaan precedes an article written about felt makers in Afghanistan. And I just think it's such a universal craft that is very primitive and old, and you can do it with no dye the way they do in Afghanistan because that is what's available to them is just the white raw wool. Or you can do many other things with it. So I always thought that was so cool to be contrasted in this publication um, internationally. Uh, during this time period where I'm really scaling back on my gallery commitments and show commitments um, while my kids are young, uh, it's easy to find me on Facebook or social media. I have a page called Spiralworks Fiber Studio where you can communicate directly with me. And I do happen to have a, a large uh, home inventory, so I'm happy to correspond with people who are looking for the work. And I do love to collaborate with uh, Central Maine artists for various pop-up uh, home studio events and shows, so you might see some of my work out and about in that way. I'm David Ellis and I'm a potter and I work out of a studio in Mercer, Maine. Nice. Uh, I work primarily in stoneware, sometimes in porcelain, and uh, I give classes and I enjoy making utilitarian things. Uh, I've been making pottery since I was a kid in high school. <laughs> uh, and it's just always been a part of my life, sometimes more serious and less serious, but it's always mm -hmm. been a part of my life. former Grange Hall and I bought it right, they'd been holding meetings right up until the moment they sold it to me and I saw it and thought it would be a great space, a big space that I could work in and um, people really like it, it's you know a community space and they're very much accustomed to seeing people coming and going and, and people feel very comfortable there too, it's got a very long history. And, uh, and I like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, with the coronavirus, it's been a little bit tricky. Uh, but we're going to do some classes this summer, a little bit reduced from what we typically do. Um, and I'm just starting um, the, the week before the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the Grange itself only has uh, wood heat, so I only run through <laughs> when when things start to get really cold. I was looking at some old antique pottery that had come to me through my family that it was actually pretty damaged, uh, but I like it, so I kept it. And, uh, it inspired me to do some work during the winter that were uh, small crocks with chickens on the, as handles on the lids, and uh, they were actually made for butter, and it would be a huge amount of butter by today's standards, but it's what they uh, would have done before the turn of the century. And also uh, what they called milk pans, which were for separating cream and milk. Um, I'm Sarah Coleman. I live in, I actually live in Dennistown, which is north of Jackman, and nobody thinks anything is north of Jackman, but, but we are. Um, but I've been making antler baskets since 19, 1990, I believe. And uh, it, it's so much fun to take something that's uh, just discarded and make it into something useful. 
and um, I just think deer antlers are so graceful and um, they're so much fun to work with instead of you know the typical market basket you know you have to stick to the confines of those square sides and where the antler baskets are just so freeform and they're, they're so much more fun to do um, and I can have a, a match set of antlers and it doesn't mean the baskets are going to be exactly the same exactly the same because um, I drill into the shed end of the antler I put, it depends on the, the size of the butt end but usually four or five holes and those will was where I'll glue in my original ribs and the slightest difference in how I um, on the angle and how I drill those in will make all the difference in the world on the shape of the basket so so it's always fun to see how they're going to come out um, and you know of course I don't hunt I, uh, I have a hard time even killing the mice in the house so I certainly don't kill the deer for the antlers um, but I um, I get a number of them at junk shops and um, I've been lucky enough that over the last few years I've had some friends that you know of course to guys, you know, that hunt, antlers are their trophies, but what do they do with them? They throw them in a box in a garage and there they sit. So I've, I've been lucky enough to have a couple of friends clean out the garages in the last few years and, and ended up with a big box of, um, of antlers. And that, that's generally where I, I get them from. Well, I taught myself. Um, I, there was a woman in town years ago who had a little craft shop and she was giving basket lessons and she had little booklets on you know how to make particular baskets so I got in one of the booklets and bought some some read and brought it home and thought well I can you know I can figure this out uh, but I happened to see uh, a booklet that was advertised in the back of some magazine that said antler baskets I thought antler baskets oh my god these things are either going to be really cool or they're going to be disgusting I just can't even imagine so I, I sent for the booklet and there were pictures in there of the baskets and I, I thought they were beautiful but then again of course I didn't want to read the directions I wanted to do it all on my own so I figured out my own way to make them um, but that's and the whole reason I started with the antler baskets was it's always hard to find well, something for my dad or my brother for Christmas and I thought well antler baskets that's rather masculine maybe that's a lot so that's how I actually got started doing them so I, um, I've done the Canaan Grange for the last three or four years now, and the Sugarloaf Show last year was the second year that I had done it, and that's just a fabulous, fabulous show. I mean, all the, uh, the artists that are there are just wonderful people with um, uh, wonderful imaginations.